Hi, I'm Kima Waterfield, and I'm reading to you from my memoir, Inside Passage, with kitten stuff on it. Um, I'd like to begin um, by acknowledging that I live and write on Salish and Glace Bay land, um, and to express my gratitude to Alaska Quarterly Review and to you, Ron Spatz, for hosting us. I'm so honored to be here with you, Karina. Um, Inside Passage is a coming of age story set on the coast of Southeast and South Central Alaska, where I began performing at a very young age at folk festivals alongside my sister and my wild young hippie mother. Um, there's a lot of music and love in these pages, a whole lot of travel by ferry and car, and there is some hardship in this story, as well as a lot of light that looks into the darkness. And I'm gonna to read to you from a bit of both of those places. The first section is from The Hard One. Um, you don't need to know much to get into this uh, chapter, except for that at this point, we have um, fled several times from my pot dealing father, many moves in the dead of night. Um, and we have met my future stepdad, Tom. <sighs> the Hard One. I want to spare you this part of my story because it is dark and hard, but also because it may be difficult to believe that what happens next isn't my entire life story. Well, in a way it is, and in another way, it isn't. It is because it shaped me, and it isn't because what happened warped the weave, but I wove myself whole out of remnants in spite of it. I've chosen to leave this hard time here because without it, I am incomplete. I grew up and through this the way a tree will absorb an obstacle in its path over time. I am a stubborn Sitka spruce with the bones of this story embedded in my flesh. I will show you the marks on my body. I fear them no more. When I think back to our time with Ray, it's easiest if I put myself in my mother's shoes. Here is Fawn, an artist with two toddler girls and big dreams. She is engaged to marry an ambitious and intelligent young man who makes her doubt everything she thinks is beautiful about herself, despite his devotion. At the airport where she's gone to buy the groom's plane ticket north for the wedding, she meets a tall man, thin with dark hair and an eye patch. He's an artist too, he tells her, and a musician. He talks her into grabbing a cup of coffee at the nearby diner when he hears she has two little girls. She sees in Ray a kindred spirit. He confesses he's always wanted a family. In fact, has a big old house in Washington, an inheritance just waiting for him to fill it with laughter. They talk about art and love and being misunderstood. She says no to dinner so many times she finally says yes. And soon she's on the phone with her fiance calling off the wedding. What about the girls? Tom asks. It's me you want to marry, she tells him. You don't understand me. We didn't return to Oregon in the fall after leaving Petersburg, but moved to Ray's hometown, Bremerton, Washington, instead. Mom transferred her student loans to the community college there and put money down on an apartment, refusing to move in with Ray at first. It's just for now, she told him. He had a habit of sulking that unnerved her. An article had run in the local paper shortly after our move, announcing a new sex offender crimes against minors registry in Seattle. It's about damn time, she said to Ray who sat silent on the couch a long time before replying. Sometimes kids are sexy though, he said finally. They just act sexy, don't you think? What the hell are you talking about, she said, afraid her trembling tongue might give her away. Kids don't know what sexy even means. She'd carried the secret of her childhood so long she didn't know how to give voice to it. He'd stalked out of the house then. He became morose after that, mopey even. He'd visit and sit on her couch in the darkest corner, staring at the ceiling for hours on end. Years later, she tells me she worried that he'd suspected her secret, that he resented her, thought her tainted. She thanked her lucky stars that she'd had girls, no sons to do to us what her brother had done to her, no crazy family to endanger us. After a couple of months, Mom drove to Oregon to pick up our belongings, leaving us with Ray for the handful of days it took to gather what little we had in storage. Tom had agreed to help her bring our things to Bremerton. He loved her, even then. Tom was sad, she said. He missed us, but I think he understood why I felt I belonged with someone 
more like me. I remember those days we were left with Ray, with the accuracy of a three-year-old child. Gray light filters through a high square window at the end of the bedroom Tegla and I share. The pillow I lie on is soaked through with tears. I am on the top bunk in our small bedroom, shivering and quiet, crying silently, while Tekla in the bunk below screams the kind of scream that makes your own throat hurt just listening. At daycare in Petersburg, they'd called her the screamer for her fits. This isn't the same thing, and I know it. At three years old, I don't understand most of what Ray says, only the cruelty of it. You think you're so sexy, don't you? Walking around like you own the world. I see the way you look at me. Think you're smart? Thought I wouldn't notice you? You are nothing, and no one cares what happens to you. The gun he shows me is black as the patch over his left eye and the smell of it makes my nose curl when he wands it over my body, head to toe. I know without a doubt what he means when he presses the gun to my temple and says, if you tell your mother, I will kill her. I choose not to remember the feel of his hands on me. I don't remember pain. The memories are there, but consciously muted. I've learned what I can from them by now. I don't need them anymore. Instead, I remember mostly what I wanted to climb from, that I wanted to climb from my bunk into Tekla's and hold her until mom came back from wherever she'd gone and we were safe. When Ray finally left us a few days later, I clamped my jaws against the possibility of his return, readying myself to bite his throat out. I knew he would kill me for trying. I think I even grasped the concept of death then, of nothingness. I yearned for it plenty in those days. I knew it for a price I would gladly pay if I could save my sister one more moment of pain. Though I never saw him again, it took 30 years, two broken teeth and thousands of dollars in mouth guards before I finally loosened my grip on his throat. Mom and Tom returned to our apartment in Bremerton to find the doors wide open, lights off, no Ray, no kids, no note. There was no answer at Ray's or their old boss's house or our downstairs neighbors. Where? Are my fucking children, Mom screamed out the window. Someone must know something, Tom said. They raced through the neighboring apartment buildings, Mom weeping and pounding bruises into her fists on every door until she heard Tekla wailing in a nearby apartment. I found them wandering around, the neighbor lady said. She was a total stranger. They were just filthy, all dirty diapers, screaming hungry and nobody there with them. I didn't know where they came from. It's anyone's guess how long we'd been left there alone in the apartment before we made our way outside. I only began to piece it together in my late twenties. The events around that time remain fragmented, the timeline imprecise. Even my own memories are hard to pin down. As for my mother, imagine your grown child asking you for the particulars of an episode no other adult witnessed, the anguish of so many unanswerable questions. Still, I'm thankful for my mother's strength and her willingness to look hard at that time of our lives with me. I could have been left alone with my memories the way she had been. When asked two decades later, Tom first said, are you sure you wanna dig into this? Some things are better left alone. And mom said, it's complicated. Ray groomed us all so thoroughly, I couldn't tell you if the sun was out or the stars during those few months we were together. We had talked about it a lot in the early years, though, on the advice of a family therapist. Do you remember Ray? Mom would ask. Sometimes I did. Sometimes I didn't admit it. Always, though, exhaustion overwhelmed me when I heard his name, a heavy-eyed paralysis that left me feeling impossibly unreal. The therapist said we couldn't let you bury it, Mom told me years later. But Grandma, who didn't yet know about her own daughter's torments, worried about dwelling on it too much lest we become obsessed with it and never let it go. Talk about it, she said, just not too much. Despite everyone's efforts, the facts scrambled. The more I tried to explain to myself how we wound up with Ray, the more things went fuzzy. As the years passed, I heard mixed stories from family members. I confused movie plots with reality. I filled in the blanks, as children do. For a long time, I thought Ray was a drug dealer that my mother had left us with him to pick up a shipment of weed from her brother in Petersburg. 
I thought she had already married Tom and was having an affair with Ray. I thought it happened in Portland because we were in Washington so short a time. I don't recall the streetlights of Bremerton, whether there are mountains there or if it rains half the year. I thought Ray had been a bad guy through and through. I thought mom had known it and left us with him anyway. This is the faulty logic of a child and there is no cure for the regret of it. I will never know who I might've been without Ray and my story, but it's not hard to guess at the sorrows I'd have owned without my mother there to help me carry the memory of him. I'm thankful for that. She knew what silence could do to a person. This too shall pass, mom said, when the weight of it all drew our heads to her shoulders. Then she gathered us girls in until we were a mess of heartbeats and legs, tangled roots reaching down into the warmth of her. My arms are big enough to hold us all until then. We grew up together in that way. The next segment um, I'm gonna read offers a glimpse into the joyful noise I grew up in. Um, because while there is trauma in this story, it is not a trauma story. Um, it is a story of love, a mother-daughter love. And um, I think this segment shows, sets the scene of this um, bonded unit that has persisted across the miles um, and decades. Um, this is called The Sound of Things. Because we never stayed in place long enough for home to land on a smell or fix itself to a room, it settled on a sound. A lone alto voice rises from the living room as mom finger picks her way through a favorite Bill Staines tune, Piney River Girl. I heard the sound of a red bird sing and the call of a whippoorwill. The kitchen is thick with the aroma of onion and garlic and ground beef. Tecla stands at the sink, up to her elbow in sudsy water. At the stove, I wrap up leftover enchiladas for lunch, dreading the unfinished math homework ahead of me. Tecla hums along, rinses a plate, and jumps in with her high soprano. I follow, but an octave above mom, because I don't have the knack for picking out a harmony the way Tecla does. In the living room, mom shifts to a low harmony, letting me drop into the melody while Tecla lays high notes over ours. As the sun pulled over the eastern ridges and warmed the morning hills. We don't plan, we don't rehearse, we don't say, how about some music while we do the dishes, Ma? We are chicks in a nest. Mom chirps out a melody and we sing it right back. Our life is a series of school days and rainy weekends in bed with books, peppered with an ongoing stream of music festivals and jam nights and gigs where mom plays music with an orbiting cast of stoned guitar players, serious fiddlers, and tipsy stand-up bassists. We miss a lot of school for music. Our teachers don't mind because we always turn in our homework and they couldn't stop us anyway. Whenever mom surprise invited us girls up on stage during a show, we'd say, we don't know any songs. And she'd say, what are you talking about? You've been singing these songs all your life. Then we'd lean into the mic and find our way home together the look in mom's eyes saying, I wouldn't rather be anywhere else. Afterward, people would come up and say, how did you teach your girls to sing like that? Which gave mom an opportunity to show off her gap teeth with a smile. I only ever taught them to listen, she'd say. They did the rest. Wherever we lived, you could count on mom to leave her little black notebook of songs and a dog-eared copy of Rise Up Singing stacked on the coffee table. They'd lay there like a pair of well-meaning elderly ants I couldn't shake. You could get serious about music if you wanted to, they seemed to say whenever I wandered past. But I'd carry on picking at a blueberry stain or digging mud out of the cuffs of my jeans because getting serious seemed like an unbearable amount of work. I preferred the effortless way mom dragged us into her song by playing them over and over and over so that on the bus ride to school, I'd catch myself singing St. James Infirmary Blues and wondering at the heartbreak of it. Let her go, let her go, let her go. God arrest her where she may be. The instruments always had a corner of their own in the living room too, where the shadows they cast could most easily scare the bejesus out of you on your way to the bathroom in the middle of the night. 
Mom had a cello, several guitars, a fiddle, a mandolin, and for a few years, a hammered dulcimer. While I could pick out a tune by ear on any of them, I only ever had serious feelings for Bessie, the cello, which I blame on the fact that mom played Bessie while pregnant with me. The first voice I ever knew was my mother's. The second was Bessie's. Bessie stood taller than I until fifth grade, a full-sized cello with a voice so deep and rich it fell on me like a prayer. I knew the shape of her the way I knew my mother's face. And when I plucked her strings, she drew me back to my mother's belly. She tied us together. I can hear her deep voice still, mom plucking her like a bass from her lowest growl to a high C on sweet Lorraine. And each night he prays that nobody steals her heart away. Eventually I got my own cello. It was a cheap cast off the music teacher at White Cliff Elementary in Ketchikan gave to me because it looked like it had been left in a bathtub overnight. After that, playing the cello was just more homework. You could be great if you'd practice, my orchestra and choir teachers said. I didn't know how to say to them, I don't want to be great. I just want to hear the pretty noise and sing when it feels right. So I said nothing. Like this, she said, pressing my fingers into the shape of an A minor chord. Now strum from the second string. I ran a thumb across the strings, feeling the weight of them as they sprang free, each one sending a warm buzz from the fretboard to my brain. Now an E, she said, moving my fingers. I aimed wide eyes at my mother and hummed, strumming again. Mom brushed a hank of long hair behind an ear and smiled all the way up to her eyes. We sat on a musty couch in a windowless old house somewhere on Douglas Island, a house we lived in so short a time I can't remember the shape of it, whether there were stairs to the front door or how far it was from either the beach or the bridge spanning Gastineau Channel that delivered us daily to Juneau for school and work. The guitar was a nameless old thing that had seen better days before my mother found it at a thrift store. Deep scratches ran the length of its back and the decorative pattern encircling the sound hole had rubbed off. I didn't mind because the sound it made felt like campfire on a cold starry night. Shoot, you could practically write a song with just those two chords, mom said. And I have in high school as a lonely teen trying out heartbreak in my twenties when I came back to music after a decade of trying to get it up for good. Now again, in my 30s, writing songs with my band. This wandering heart is lonesome as a windowless room. I hear my mother and sister when a new song tugs at me. Tekla's fierce highs and my mother's crooning lows, their harmonies ghosting across state lines and time zones to find me. In those moments, I feel them out there, my heart sirens calling me home. <laughs>